Hi, how's it going? So this is Dr. A with your chapter nine lesson on managed care impact on healthcare delivery for US healthcare. So we're going to define managed care. We're gonna look at the different network types of managed care organizations. So that'd be like the HMOs and PPOs and so, so forth. And then we're gonna discuss the history of managed care and look at cost control of managed care. So the concept of managed care has been evolving since the early 1930s. Um, and um, this health plan employer data and information data set, which is called HEDIS, uh, is a data set of the healthcare plan service activities and is used to evaluate healthcare plans, which means that basically every time a, um, a claim is filed and all that, it enters into this database. It is voluntary, but uh, nearly 100% of the health plans are submitting their data to head us. And then you can see what kind of claims are filed, where, where cost is going, what different, um, you know, cost of various services where people are spending their money in healthcare by uh, analyzing the plans, the, the, the claims into each of the plans, which is really can generate a lot of good data that um, can be used to make decisions on. According to Fortune Magazine's analysis of the industries, managed care has the highest growth rate of the five or five major healthcare sectors. The, some of the other healthcare sectors are pharmaceuticals and biotech, um, the sector of just all the healthcare facilities. That's another one. The Affordable Care Act of 2010 mandates that health insurance companies must spend 80 to 85 percent of their premium revenues on quality health care. So that would mean the, uh, they only get the only 15 to 20 percent to spend on, uh, well, on profit. That would be for their shareholders if they're a full profit. But usually managed care type stuff, um, insurance companies, most of them should be non-profit. Um, so that that can go strictly to administrative costs and salaries and all of that, everything else. 80 to 85% is on actually paying for care and quality care at that. Um, managed care refers to the cost management of healthcare services utilization by controlling who the consumer sees and how much the service costs. So those are the two big leverage things that they use to control healthcare costs. Managed care organizations were introduced about 40 years ago, but became more entrenched in the healthcare system when the uh, Health Maintenance Organization Act of 1973 was signed into law by President Nixon. From 1850 to 1900, so this is like in the history of managed care, uh, railroad mining and lumber companies, which uh, back then obviously um, it was a lot of manual labor, so they, they employed a lot of employees, so they were large companies, right? Um, and they provided their employees with health care. And the way they did that is they contracted a physician and that physician would come provide services to their employees at a rate per worker. And so, if you will, the physician was kind of salaries. He was uh, a company uh, person uh, and he was paid by this number of employees. So, uh, and he had to take care of all the employees and give them health care and stuff. Uh, managed care pioneer Dr. Michael Shadid started a farmer co-op health plan in 1921, uh, 1929, sorry, in Oklahoma, and he enrolled several hundred families who paid a set fee and received care from Dr. Shadid. Also in 1929, the LA Department of uh, Health contracted with some physicians to provide healthcare services to 2,000 workers and families. So again, very similar. Uh, it's a contract between uh, physicians and a company to provide care for workers. In 1933, Dr. Sidney Garfield contracted with 5,000 construction workers to prepay for their health care. And in 1938, he contracted with Henry Kaiser to provide medical care to his workers for a dam project. So all of these are examples of early managed care. Then the Committee on Cost of Medicare Care recommended in 1932 that healthcare should be reorganized into a type of prepaid formula to control costs. So already 100 years ago, they were concerned about cost of healthcare. And this is before we had all the technology and things that we have today. In 1973, President Nixon signed into law the HMO Act. This act authorized $375 million in funding through loans and grants for HMO expansion of existing facilities, thus rewarding HMOs for focusing on cost control and, of course, causing a growth for HMOs. In 1988, then the HMO Act was amended to allow employees to contribute less to HMO plans than traditional fee-for-service plans, so that made the HMO plans more affordable. Um, and so people you know, kind of flocked in that direction because you could get care for less money. 
1982, the Tax Equity and Fiscal Responsibility Act reduced the federal funding for health care, uh, including HMOs. The Balanced Budget Act of 1997 then established Medicare Plus Choice, which was Part C, and uh, which developed different structures for managed care plans within Medicare. And then in 2003, that Medicare Prescription Drug Improvement and Modernization Act uh, replaced uh, Medicare Plus Choice with Medicare Advantage. Again, still it's a managed care plan for Medicare. Some of the characteristics of managed care are one, they establish relationships with organizations and with providers. So if you look at some of those examples, those organizations were maybe a railroad company, a lumber company, a construction um, company, and um, with a provider, so, so the company and a provider, a doctor, and the, to provide a designated set of services to their members. So it could be primary care or whatever, but it could also be surgical services or whatever. Um, the, another managed care characteristic is that they establish criteria for their members to utilize a managed care organization. And um, they establish measures to estimate cost control. So cost control is definitely a focus of managed care. Um, and so they measure this thing, what, things that you would track um, to, to see where your costs are, are going and stuff. And they also provide incentives to encourage health services um, utilization of their resources. So um, like, you know they they would they tend to focus on preventive care and all of that so that uh, preventive care is cheaper and uh, especially in the long run and so um, they would encourage for example uh, you know to get your flu shots and immunizations and things like that they provide and encourage the utilization of programs to improve the health status of their enrollees so for example if you were a diabetic patient, they would encourage you to go through a diabetic education for you know, how to lead a diabetic, diabetes lifestyle, how to control your blood sugar and all that kind of stuff so that, um, you know, their diabetic patients are healthier and therefore less sick and less using less resources or, or not as um, costs, you know, they're more cost effective. Okay, so if you're doing the Nearpod homework, uh, just watch this video and uh, answer the question within the video. And the video is over these different managed care models. So there's the health maintenance organization is one. It is the oldest type of managed care. The members must see their primary care provider first in order to see a specialist. So that is what we call a gatekeeper model. So you have to have a referral from your primary care provider to see a specialist. So to go see a cardiologist, to go see a dermatologist or something like that. Now, within HMO, there are several different models. There's a staff model, uh, and the HMO hires providers to work at a physical location. So basically, in that model, then the, the providers of doctors are in one set locations, and they're hired by the M MCO. So they're like, if you, if you would like salaried by a managed care organization. Okay, the group model negotiates with a group of physicians so it um, could be a clinic, you know, a group of a big clinic, like you would think of like the NEA Baptist Clinic in this area, for example. Uh, and, but the, with the group model, these physicians are to exclusively perform services for the managed care uh, organization, meaning they cannot see any other patients outside the managed care organization. So that was the first type of HMO model that was um, introduced by Kaiser Permanente. So again, the physicians work for them, for managed care, the managed care organizations, and the, the uh, members that were covered had to go to those physicians and could not go anywhere else, and those physicians could not see anybody else. Okay. And then um, the network model was similar to the group model, but the providers could see other patients who were not members of the HMO. So the provider, the, the clinic, the group of physicians, the, they could see other non-HMO members and the seed HMO members also and so it was just it was a contract if you will but it was an exclusive contract so that's the network model and that was more popular because physicians do like having the choice of you know uh, who they can see and not be limited they are also independent practice associations are groups of physicians who are in private practice to see um, managed care organization members at a prepaid rate per visit 
these physicians can con uh, sign contracts with many HMOs. So they would get in organizations. So for example, a cardiologist would group together in an IPA. And then as an IPA, they would contract with many different HMOs to see their, those um, patients and they get paid uh, a prepaid rate per visit. And then you have the next big one is the PPO, so the Preferred Provider Organizations. They don't have a gatekeeper like the HMO, so you do not need a referral from your primary care provider to see a specialist. Um, in PPOs, you don't have a copay, but you do have a deductible. Uh, and uh, it was developed by providers and hospitals to ensure that non-members could still be served while providing a discount to the managed care organizations for their members. So again, uh, more open, um, so more kind of like the network model of the HMO. Uh, but this was, again, this was developed by providers and hospitals so that, again, they could, they could serve a larger population, but still give discounted services. Then you have the exclusive provider organizations or the EPOs. They're similar to the PPOs, except they restrict members to a list of preferred or exclusive providers that members can use. So um, again, they're like, you, you have to be in this specific list of providers um, and that's, you know, or, or it's basically not paid for. The phys physician hospital organizations um, are, um, a little like a, a spin off those IPAs, but it, it's physician, hospitals, surgical centers, and other medical providers all banding together and then contracting with a managed care plan to provide uh, health services to the uh, members of the managed care plan. Okay, so this is an activity here. So match these funds using the information from the slides and from the video. So you need to basically PPO, EPO in the three different HMO models and match them with the definition. Okay, carrying on to the managed care payment plan. So with a capitation policy or per member per month policy, the provider is paid a fixed monthly amount per employee, which is often called a PMPM payment. So per member per, per month, PMPM is what it sounds. So just in case you want a capitation capita, uh, if you know, you did your paper per capita. We were looking at the per capita cost, healthcare cost. That's per, per capita is per head. Okay, so a capitation policy is a per head, per person, per member, per member per month. That's where it came from. So again, um, they they get a fixed amount uh, per employee that's covered uh, that they're servicing, but the um, whether or not that. A member uses the services or not. Uh, so that's the per member per month policy. There are also discounted fees. So it's a type of fee for services, but the fees are discounted and based on the fee schedule. Now, who establishes the fee schedule is the MCO. Okay. And so uh, if they say according to their fee schedule, um, this is how much we pay for this, this is how much we pay for that, and this is how much we pay for that. And the provider agrees to provide the service and uh, ba then can build the MCO based on the agreed upon fee schedule. So they can't charge the members more than the what's on the established fee schedule and it won't be paid more than what's on the established fee schedule. Uh, salaries are the third method of payment. In this instance, the provider is actually an employee of the MCO. So for example, that staff model of the HMO would more, more likely um, just have those uh, staff positions uh, would be salaried. So um, a little bit more on cost control. So the other way is restriction on provider choice. So the members of a managed care organization often have restrictions on their choice for a provider. So they have lists of physicians. Um, if anything, you have in-network and out-of-network, and in-network is always cheaper and better covered than out-of-network. And in some instances, it's like, this is who you can see and you can't see anybody else. Uh, and sometimes that can be uh, troublesome, especially if you don't have one close by. 
uh, gatekeeping. So in some MCOs, the primary care provider is a gatekeeper. So like especially in those HMOs, um, and they're the gatekeeper for all the care of the patients. Um, any secondary or tertiary care has to be coordinated by the gatekeeper. So that would be any referral to a uh, specialist, um, referral to the hospital for admit to be admitted to the hospital, all that kind of stuff. All of that has to go through the primary care provider or the gatekeeper. Then um, another way that managed care co control costs is utilization review. So this is looking at how appropriate the services are that are provided. This is an aspect that a lot of times physicians don't really care for because there's somebody basically looking over their shoulder at, as to whether or not what they're, they are choosing to do for their patients is appropriate or not. So they may for example, decide, oh, I want to see this, this, this test, and this test, and the managed care organization says, oh, no, you don't really need that. some of those. Some of those you should get, some of these you don't need, um, and so we don't, you know, we don't think that's appropriate, so we don't pay for those. So, and so there's a limit of the freedom of how the physician practices, but there are three types of utilization reviews. There are prospective, concurrent, and retrospective. So prospective utilization is always before the service is actually performed and the procedure has to be authorized by the MCO based on clinical guidelines. So for example, um, if you had a messed up knee and you needed to get a, a MRI or a CT scan or something like that, which are kind of expensive, uh, prospective utilization review would require you to get approval from your ins insurance company if your insurance company was a managed care organization. Um, as to whether or not you can get the um, MRI or the CT. And then also they may even dictate where you go get it um, and then how much it would cost, et cetera. So um, then once it's authorized, then you can go get it and uh, it, then the service would be reimbursed. Uh, concurrent utilization review are decisions that are made during the actual course of service. So a lot of times it has to be do with inpatient stay or need for additional surgeries and stuff like that. So if you get admitted to the hospital for a certain diagnosis, um, the managed care plan may uh, initially, let's say, pay for three days of hospitalization. That's by default. And then maybe you need to stay longer. So the hospital ha have to seek authorization for them to pay for more days based on what's going on with, with the patient and stuff. And then retrospective, retrospective utilization reviews look at the services once the services have been provided. So um, this could, you know, they can do that to look at treatment patterns of certain diseases. So they could go and, you know, pick a clinic and look at all the diabetic patients and see what services they are providing to their diabetic patients and whether or not these are appropriate, whether they need to do more or less or more of one thing and less of another. Okay, so a little bit about Medicare Managed Care, which is Medicare Advantage or Medicare Part C. So Medicare, again, are for our elderly. It was implemented in 2000. The purpose of Medicare Plus Choice was to encourage Medicare and release to use managed care, obviously to cost for cost control. And uh, Medicare uh, at that time offered risk plans and cost plans to their employees as part of this Medicare Plus choice. So the risk plans paid a premium per member that is based on a county of residence basis. So um, where you live um, can also determine like how much healthcare cost would cost. So there's a difference in the cost, for example, in New York City and LA versus, you know, here in Arkansas. And members could use both in-network and out-of-network providers, and the risk plan covered all Medicare services and vision and prescription care. The cost plan uh, reimbursed the managed care on a preset monthly basis per enrollee. So again, kind of a per enrollee per month kind of thing, and it's based on the forecasted budget. Uh, and the cost plan allowed the members to pursue care outside of the network also. Uh, in 2003, the Medicare Prescription and Drug Improvement and Modernization Act renamed the program Medicare Advantage and allowed PPOs as an option. It also allowed enrollees to participate in private fee-for-service plans as part of Medicare Advantage, but of course the fees to participate in those plans would then be higher. Okay, so there's a video here with a question I want you to watch on Medicare um, Advantage and maybe some of the disadvantages of that.
All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about Medicaid managed care. So if you remember, Medicaid are for the poor. And um, all states except Alaska and Wyoming have uh, Medicaid managed care. And the Medicaid managed care plans use a gatekeeper model. So they have to go through their primary care provider, um, which is then, so that's the HMO type of plan and a prepaid health plan. So they are um, paid, you know, per, mem per member per month of the providers are to manage their Medicaid pa uh, patient load. Carve outs are services that Medicaid is not obligated to pay for under the MCO contract. Uh, in, for example, um, mental health services can often be um, in, in the carve outs and carve outs occur because uh, the managed care organization cannot provide the service or it's just too expensive. So again, unfortunately, mental health services, substance abuse treatment services are often categorized as carve out services. They just cannot provide it, even though the population needs it it's too expensive for them to, to be able to, to pay for it. So they just carved that out of the list of things that are covered. Um, a little bit on assessment of managed care organizations. So there's the National Committee on Quality Assurance. It was established in 1990 to monitor the health plans and to improve healthcare quality because a lot of times when you control cost and you try to reduce cost, you can also reduce quality. So that's uh, something that you know they need, really need to keep an eye on. Um, so this uh, NCQA accredits the managed care organizations, although it's a voluntary review process, it does include surveys by um, managed care experts and physicians, they're looking over and seeing how uh, everything is being managed and done. Of course, we men mentioned HEDIS, the Health Plan Employer Data Information Set, um, was established by this NCQA in 89 and it is used by nearly 100% of all health plans to measure service and quality of care. And um, this reported data is available to the managed care uh, organizations and the physicians and stuff. And you can go dig in and see what's going on. So many issues with managed care. Okay, so physicians who contract with several managed care organizations are concerned with providing quality of care to the patients because the NCOs focus on costs. And so they can often dictate them like what they can and can't do or what they, because it basically, if you will, if the MCO won't pay for it, then in essence, the physician really can't do that service or they would have to do it for free, right? And some of these things, it's not always possible because there's a cost to doing it. So an example would be lab test. As a result of the MCO's focus on cost, a physician's ability to practice without close monitoring of their healthcare choices is limited. Again, so that's a downside of MCO. Surveys indicate that the more managed care networks the physicians contracts with, the less satisfied they are with managed care. The uh, accreditation, so the Joint Commission uh, and the NCQA have been accrediting all the different types of MCOs. Since 1983, the Accreditation Association for Ambulatory Healthcare has been accrediting MCOs also. Um, and they have received Medicare deemed status from the CMS, which means that the AAAHC can survey um, Medicare Advantage, HMOs, and PPO plans. Um, and they, uh, they are the largest accreditor in Florida. And of course, there's a lot of retired people in Florida, so there's a lot of Medicare uh, plans and stuff there too. It has accredited 6,100 uh, managed care organizations. Some of the challenges to MCOs, <clears throat> physicians are unclear about the oblig obligations to the MCO. Um, and so AMA has developed a national managed care contract uh, to, to kind of help that to, because you know they have to put, uh, physicians are under contract with each um, managed care organization and sometimes they may not understand the extent of the contract. Physicians are concerned with um, what we call physician network rentals or silent PPOs. Um, so there are unauthorized third parties outside of the contract between MCO and a physician that gain access to the MCO discount rates, but without having all the obligations. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a problem also. Examples of these uh, networks, these silent networks are um, on, well, network rentals or silent networks, silent networks or silent PPOs are, for example, automobile insurance or workman's comp insurers, 
to obtain the physician's rates from a database and compete using this information. And the main insurer who has a contract with the physician does not provide the information to the physician and the third parties continue to benefit from the discounted rates. So several states prohibit these silent PPOs from operating because they're like undermining the managed care organizations in their contracts and stuff. And by taking this book, by, it's like basically getting a member discount without being a member. That's kind of the problem. Challenges, uh, more challenges to NCO, the value-based reimbursement model. So um, the managed care organizations need to understand that both efficiency and quality are the highest priorities, not just uh, efficiency. So, uh, so efficiency meaning more, doing more with less, um, but we also need to turn out quality, right? And so doing data-driven decision-making needs to be integrated into the culture, uh, again, with uh, electronic health records and with all the electronic claims and all these the headers and everything like that. We have the data, it's just analyzing it uh, and using it to make the appropriate decisions for um, the choices of what's paid for, what's effective, what's not, what's quality, what's not, etc. Uh, there's uh, another challenge, the increasing drug cost, um, and so they focus more on generic drugs because of that, um, because generic drugs are cheaper. Uh, and um, Sorry for that slight interruption. My whole system had frozen for a second. So uh, I'm going to go back just a second. So increasing the drug costs. So um, they focus more on generic drugs because they're cheaper. And so they may not reimburse for name and brand drugs. And they may only reimburse for drugs that are, have made it to the generic market. Uh, and they also need to do consumer advocacy, so they need to market their plans, uh, which is an absolute necessity, so that people know what choices they have. Okay, so I want you, if you're in the near pod, to tell me uh, one positive and one negative thing about managed care. And so in conclusion, uh, the managed care model for healthcare delivery was developed for the primary purpose of containing healthcare costs by administering both the healthcare services and the reimbursement of the services so everything is together like it's like providers and health insurance all in one and therefore eliminating any, any kind of third-party health insurer the industry felt that this model would be very cost effective both the consumer or the patient and the physician's concern were the same they worry about providing uh, getting quality care or providing quality care while focusing predominantly on cost, because if you focus on cost, you usually end up with just cheaper care, not better care. Uh, the consumer was also worried about the loss of freedom of choice of the primary care provider. What if their physician that's been their family physician for their entire life or whatever now is not no longer in the network? You know, that can cause worry. Uh, and the physician was worried about loss of income because they're not, you know, managed care organizations don't reimburse as much. And so, um, you know, it's, they have to see basically a higher volume of patients to be able to make adequate income. But if you're seeing a higher volume of patients, then maybe you're not giving quality of care. So, you know, lots of issues here, a um, little tug, tug of war going between quality, um, cost, efficiency, and all of that. All right, and that is it. That's the lesson. If you have any questions, you can put them in the Nearpod. And I uh, thank you for your attention. I'm sorry about that little glitch towards the end.